Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see everyone. It's been a couple days to all the weary travelers. Welcome back. Uh, let me start with a few things and then we'll turn to happy Groundhog Day. Happy Groundhog Day. Let me uh, mention a couple things at the top and then we'll turn to your questions. First, today marks three months since the government of Ethiopia and the Tigray People's Liberation Front signed a permanent cessation of hostilities agreement in Pretoria, ending a horrific two year conflict. Immediately after the signing, the fighting stopped. Over the past three months, we have seen important progress by the parties in implementing key aspects of this agreement, including the steady and growing delivery of humanitarian aid, initial steps and discussions about a uh, transitional justice process, the ongoing restoration of services, electricity, telecommunications, and banking, significant turnover of heavy weapons, and in the past couple of weeks, a pullback of air train forces from the <coughs> region. We commend the parties for their commitment to the uh, cessation of hostilities agreement and encourage continued implementation, including ensuring the protection of civilians through international human rights monitoring, as well as following through on accountability for human rights abuses and transitional justice. <laughs> as the Secretary conveyed to Prime Minister Abi in their January 21st call, the United States is committed to supporting the African Union and its high-level panel to ensure the cessation of hostilities agreement delivers a lasting peace uh, and efforts to avoid further conflict and human, right, human rights violations in Oromia. We continue to seek peace and stability in Ethiopia to build upon the long-standing, strong partnership between our governments and our peoples. Next, as further details have come to light, the United States strongly condemns the unilateral January 30th release by Sudanese authorities of Abdul, Abdul Rauf Abu Zaid, the individual convicted of the 2008 killing of our colleagues, John Granville and Abdul Rahman Abbas. The Sudanese claim that the Granville family had extended forgiveness is false. We call on the Sudanese government to exercise all available legal means to reverse this decision and to rearrest Abu Zaid. The 2020 U.S. Sudan bilateral settlement of legal claims did not address Abu Zaid's imprisonment or his sentence. We heard the heartfelt statement by John Granville's mother, and we reaffirm our condolences to the families of the victims of this horrific, targeted terrorist attack, and will continue to urge that Abu Zaid be held fully accountable for the murder of John Granville and Abdul Rahman Abbas. The safety of U.S. citizens and embassy personnel abroad remains the highest priority of this administration. Today, we convoke the Sudanese ambassador to the United States. In addition, our ambassador in Sudan, John Godfrey, is engaging Sudanese officials at the highest levels on this issue. And Deputy Assistant Secretary Peter Lord is heading next week to Khartoum, where he will also take up this critical issue to demand action. We will not relent. Finally, yesterday, the Department of State announced actions to impose additional visa restrictions under Section 212A3C, or 3C, of the Immigration and Nationality Act for certain uh, current or former Taliban members, members of non-state security groups, and other individuals believed to be responsible for or complicit in repressing women and girls in Afghanistan. The immediate family members of such persons may also be subject to these visa restrictions. This is consistent with our prior actions under the associated 3C policy and includes six individuals involved in discontinuing uh, and or restricting access to secondary and university level education for girls and women, preventing women's full participation in the workforce and their ability to choose their careers, and restricting women's and girls' exercise of their human rights. Due to visa confidentiality laws, we are unable to name the individuals who are subject to this policy. But the Taliban cannot expect the respect and support of the international community until they respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all Afghans. And of course, that includes women and girls. We condemn in the strongest terms the Taliban's actions. The United States stands with the Afghan people, and we remain committed to doing all we can to promote and to advance the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms of all Afghans, including, again, of course, it's women and girls. With that, uh, this will sound like Groundhog, Groundhog's Day, but Matt, <laughs> turn it over to you. Well, it's winter for apparently yes. another, another little while yeah. now. Um, I've got uh, a couple things, but I promise they'll each be brief. The first one on um, your statement on Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple days ago, the secretary met with the Israeli foreign minister who was earlier today in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if uh, 
if, if he mentioned the case of, of Mr. Granville's murder, he, 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 Granville is actually from my hometown. Um, but was did you ask the Israelis to raise this, or did you not know that the visit was happening? These these reports uh, have, of course, broken over the past couple of days. Uh, it is our understanding that the Israeli foreign minister's travel uh, has also developed over uh, recent days. Uh, but suffice to say that we are raising this at the highest levels in the starkest terms uh, with the Sudanese authorities to see to it uh, that there is justice in this case. Well, and, and if this was not covered in the um, compensation, uh, why, why are there people suggesting um, that it was. That's a better. That is a better. That is a better question for Sudanese authorities. It is our contention that this was not a part uh, of the agreement in 2020. Uh, it is our contention that uh, the perpetrator of this horrific terrorist attack uh, should remain behind bars. And you, and you don't think there's any way that it could have been interpreted by the Sudanese to. Well, we have heard various claims, including the erroneous claim that uh, Sudanese authorities have heard forgiveness uh, from the family of John Granville. Uh, you don't have to take our word for it. You can read the statement that was put out by his family that makes clear uh, that too is false. All right. Um, secondly, uh, do you, and I don't really expect an answer on this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Always um, appreciate that. Do you have any, uh, <laughs> do you have any thoughts about the composition of the House Foreign Affairs Committee? Uh, you know, this is a question that, uh, of course, is a question for uh, Congress to answer. These are decisions that are up to Congress, uh, including, uh, namely, uh, congressional leadership. I suspect uh, you're asking about the case of Representative Ilhan Omar. Uh, I'm not going to weigh in on the composition of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. What I can say uh, is that uh, we have appreciated uh, Representative Omar's constructive engagement with the department in the 117th Congress, and we look forward to working with uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, and all relevant members of Congress in the 118th Congress. Thank you. And then the last one, um, Aid addressed this yesterday, and I'm sorry if I missed it on my way back from Israel, but um, there seems to be, a, and so if it has been addressed, you can look for more. Um, this perfumble between the Hungarian government and your ambassador there? I, I don't know that that was uh, addressed yesterday. I'm also not sure I would call it a uh, we have an ambassador in Budapest, um, as we do have ambassadors in capitals around the world, uh, who are standing up for uh, American interests, American values, uh, who are um, promoting uh, those elements uh, in ways that uh, is uh, appropriate, uh, given their roles and responsibilities. Uh, of course, we have a long relationship with uh, our Hungarian ally. Hungary is uh, an important NATO ally. Uh, that is not to see that we see eye to eye on every issue. Of course, uh, there are many issues where we do have uh, divergences of opinion or just flat out disagreements. Uh, Ambassador Pressman uh, is uh, there in Budapest to represent uh, our interests, our values. Uh, when we do have those disagreements, he can uh, convey that to uh, our Hungarian allies uh, in Paris, and that's what he does. Okay. So there's no, you, you don't have an issue with, with anything that he has said. Uh, as I have seen the coverage of, of what he has done and what he has said, I see an ambassador uh, who is working to protect and promote well, the values have, and interests of the United States. Do you have an issue with how the Hungarians are treated him? Or particularly the, the foreign minister, the former foreign ministry? We, of course, we always have an issue when we see what at least appears to us to be a concerted effort uh, on the part of senior officials in the Hungarian government uh, and some elements of the government-controlled press uh, attempting to discredit the ambassador, in some cases attempting to uh, discredit the United States. Uh, when we see that, we are clear about our concerns, uh, and Ambassador Pressman is well placed to convey those concerns. Can I follow up on Ilhan Omar? Sure. Uh, I know you don't interfere in congressional matters and so on. But, you know, the facts speak for themselves. I mean, the, the Republicans have put a target on her back. I mean, she's been uh, receiving hundreds of threats to her life, to her family, and so on. That's exactly <coughs> a cause of concern. Okay. Said, I'm just not going to and weigh in on this. Because she, you know, she from where to support for the Palestinian cause. 
And Said, I'm just not going to weigh in on this. Uh, I saw that Representative Jeffries, uh, Minority Leader Jeffries, uh, did offer uh, his uh, own statement on this. I just uh, don't have anything to offer on this. Uh, we'll go here. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions about the um, sort of looking back at the trip to uh, to the Middle East. Sure. Um, in terms of what was uh, achieved during that, I wonder, firstly, um, on the issue of the consulate for the Palestinians, have you, have you made any more progress from that trip uh, towards reopening? I think you heard this from the Secretary when uh, he was sitting next to President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, our position on a consulate in Jerusalem has not changed. We remain committed uh, to reopening the consulate in uh, Jerusalem, just as we have uh, remained committed to reestablishing our relationship with the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian uh, people. This is a relationship that goes back many decades, uh, well over a century. It was an early task of this administration to see to it that we had a relationship uh, that served our interests, that was consistent with our values, that served the interests uh, of the Palestinian people. Uh, we've taken a number of steps. Uh, we have uh, spoken of our commitment to reopening this consulate in Jerusalem. Uh, late last year in December, we established a Washington-based special representative for Palestinian affairs, Hadi Amr. Uh, is now serving in that role. He was uh, sitting close to the secretary in that meeting with President Abbas. Um, since April of 2021, we have demonstrated uh, in very real and significant terms our commitment to the humanitarian needs of the Palestinian people. Uh, we've provided over $890 million for uh, Palestinians, including over $680 million in humanitarian assistance for refugees uh, in um, the region through UNRWA, and an additional $150 million in development and economic assistance through USAID. Uh, when Secretary Blinken was uh, in Ramallah, he announced another $50 million uh, in funding for UNRWA. That marked the first tranche of UNRWA funding uh, we provided in fiscal year of 2023 funding. So in a number of ways, we are going to continue to support the humanitarian needs of the Palestinian people, as well as the aspirations uh, of Palestinian people. That was a, a central point of conversation on the most recent trip. But given all that, why is it that you're still unable to, you know, do the, the quite basic thing of reopening the consulate? These, these things take time. Uh, obviously, there are various parties that uh, are involved in a, in a process like this, we're working <coughs> through those. Uh, but I don't want to suggest that reopening of the consulate is the totality of what we are doing uh, to improve the lives uh, of the humanitarian people. And in fact, uh, it is only a rather uh, single uh, and perhaps even small element uh, of that compared to uh, all that we have put forward already, uh, what we have uh, contributed in terms of our humanitarian assistance, uh, the team that we have in Jerusalem and our Office of Palestinian Affairs, uh, and now uh, the new position of uh, special representative uh, based here in, in Washington, looking at ways to help uh, the Palestinian people to alleviate uh, their humanitarian plight uh, and to do that in very real and, and practical ways. Can I follow one, on? Sorry, one more um, um, If you could give us an update on the, the work that the officials stay behind to do, you know, is there any progress on uh, potentially uh, restoring security co cooperation or, um, you know, convincing Palestinian authorities to do more in terms of... Uh, uh, taking more responsibility for mm -hmm. security in different parts of the West Bank. Well, it was an important moment for the Secretary to travel to Israel and the West Bank for a number of reasons, but uh, of course the travel came in the context of um, really um, uh, horrific levels uh, of violence, uh, levels of violence that have taken uh, far too many innocent lives. Uh, the, while there, the secretary was in a position to uh, hear from the parties, and by parties in this case, I mean not only Israelis and Palestinians, but uh, also our first stop was Egypt. Uh, and Egypt has played an important role uh, over many decades now, uh, helping to uh, maintain or restore uh, calm and stability. Uh, that's been the case in, in recent years as well. Uh, so it was important that we first uh, travel to Cairo uh, to speak with uh, President Sisi, with Foreign Minister Shukri, uh, with other members of the Egyptian government to hear their ideas, uh, to see to it that 
our actions, uh, our messaging was coordinated uh, with that in hand. Uh, the Secretary then traveled to uh, Jerusalem and Ramallah uh, to hear ideas from Israelis and Palestinians uh, and really to impart the message uh, of the urgency of de-escalating, uh, of uh, <coughs> taking concrete steps to stop the violence, to reduce tensions, uh, but also over the longer term to uh, create a foundation for uh, a more uh, positive, uh, ambitious horizon going forward for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Uh, as he noted in his final press conference, uh, two senior members of our State Department team uh, have stayed behind, Barbara Lee, our Assistant Secretary for um, the uh, Near East, as well as uh, Hadi Amr, the aforementioned Hadi Amr, uh, did stay back to continue those uh, consultations. Um, they uh, are holding consultations with key parties um, to hear ideas and to make clear that the United States is uh, willing and able to support the steps, to support the parties as they take steps uh, that we certainly hope will restore calm. Uh, they're meeting with a range of Palestinian and Israeli leaders, uh, including security officials, including political officials, um, as did the secretary. And the secretary also had an opportunity while there to meet with elements of civil society, which is, which is also important. Uh, stimming the violence is, is paramount. Um, they are uh, there to support the parties uh, and the steps the parties uh, will have to take uh, to break this cycle of violence. Uh, our overarching goal is to support the de-escalation of tensions and to work with the parties uh, to take action, again, to lessen the violence, which, as I mentioned before, has already taken uh, far too many uh, far too many lives. Yes, I, I just follow up on the trip. Uh, during the trip, the secretary and you know, the whole team went into the Palestinian town of Jerdeba, where many Palestinian uh, hold U.S. citizenship and so on. And I think probably the common concern for all of them is to be able to go to Jerusalem and, and without, you know, not, not to be you know, easier for them to go to Europe than to go to Jer Jerusalem. So what steps have you taken or are taken right now in that regard? When it comes to freedom of movement for... For Palestinian Americans. For, so, Saeed, a couple of things. First of all, we did go to Dare and, and we went there uh, to engage with civil society. And so we sat down with uh, a number of civil society leaders, including uh, Palestinian Americans, to hear their perspective. These are individuals who frequently do travel uh, back and forth between uh, the West Bank and the United States. And so, uh, of course, their perspective on these questions uh, is valuable. We're working on this through a number of ways. Uh, one very concrete way is through the visa waiver program. And of course, when we talk about the visa waiver program, we often talk about it through the lens of Israelis uh, being able to travel uh, visa-free to the United States once Israel uh, completes all the steps required for entry into the visa waiver program. But I think what's often overlooked uh, is that these elements would be reciprocal. That is to say, if Israelis are able to travel to the United States visa-free, uh, then Americans uh, would and should and must uh, be allowed uh, unhindered access to Ben Gurion Airport, for example. Uh, that would apply to Palestinian Americans. Anyone who has a blue passport would be able to travel to and from Israel, landing in Ben Gurion and going to a place like Der Dablan, going to a place like Ramallah, uh, unimpeded. That is that is important to us. Well, how about a place like Jerusalem? To, to it is it is important to us uh, that citizens that our citizens have the ability to travel freely. Uh, and of course, these are conversations that we're so having. In other words, you 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 are demanding that Israel allow Palestinian Americans <clears throat> access not just to Ben Gurion to get to the West Bank, but access to Ben Gurion so that they could go to. Well, they could stay in Tel Aviv, or they could go to Jerusalem. There, there, go there are there are stipulations that are, that are included in the visa waiver program. Israel uh, just met one of those uh, uh, stipulations. They now have the rest of this fiscal year to meet uh, other requirements if they do seek entry into the visa waiver program. Uh, part of that is unimpeded access to uh, Ben Gurion and freedom of movement for American citizens. Okay, does that mean that that includes within Israel, not excluding? excluding the West Bank? Uh, a blue passport is a blue passport. 
And that is the point of the visa waiver program. Let me follow up on a couple of points. The Axios uh, uh, published a story yesterday uh, that uh, the Secretary of State pressed Abbas to accept the U.S. security plan for Janine. Is there anything you could share with us on this? Look, I'm, uh, we issued, or I should say the Secretary had some fairly lengthy remarks after his meeting with President Abbas. Uh, we traveled to Ramallah just as we traveled to Jerusalem to hear from the parties themselves the steps that they could take uh, to de-escalate tensions, to reduce uh, the level of violence, and to uh, put relations between Israelis and Palestinians on a more sustainable path. Uh, our team works very closely with the U.S. security coordinator on the ground. He uh, regularly consults uh, with both parties as well. But ultimately, these are steps that the parties themselves uh, are going to have to take. What did that mean? I mean, according to the story, it says that uh, we were hard on that because they are not doing their part in terms of chasing after militants and so on in Janine and other places. You want to revamp or restructure their security forces and so on. Is that what happened? Is that a fair assessment of what happened? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into the meeting beyond what Secretary Blinken said in that rather lengthy statement, but uh, the Palestinian Authority has certain responsibilities. One of those is to condemn violence and to do everything in its uh, authority, everything uh, within its power uh, to prevent acts of violence, to certainly refrain from uh, incitement uh, to violence, uh, and to do everything it can to, in this case, restore uh, a sense of calm, a sense of stability, uh, so that, again, we can put relations between Israelis and Palestinians on a more peaceful, on a more sustainable path, uh, so that we can emerge from this current period of tensions and hopefully build on that to, to create a brighter horizon for both Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, and my last, on uh, Amnesty International just issued a report uh, in painting a very bleak picture on the system in place. It calls it apartheid and says that, you know, this is getting much worse for the Palestinians. That, in fact, you know, while so much energy is spent on talking about the two-state solution and conflict wars, it has never been so improbable. Is a general matter, Saeed, we don't offer comprehensive evaluations or assessments uh, on reports by uh, third-party groups. Uh, we have our own rigorous process for documenting and reporting on human rights issues uh, around the world. We issue those findings uh, annually in the uh, Global Human Rights Report. Uh, that report and throughout every other 364 days of the year, uh, we make clear our commitment to promoting respect uh, for human rights in Israel and uh, the West Bank and Gaza Strip and, and around the world for that matter. Uh, we have an enduring partnership with Israel and discuss a wide range of issues with the Israeli government, uh, including those related to human rights. We support the efforts of the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority alongside human rights activists to ensure accountability uh, for human rights abuses uh, and potential violations. We continue to emphasize to Israel and the Palestinian Authority the need to refrain from unilateral actions that only serve to exacerbate uh, those very tensions. Uh, this includes annexation of territory, settlement activity, demolitions, incitement to violence, uh, and providing compensation for individuals imprisoned uh, for acts of terrorism. Uh, this was a part of the conversations we had in <laughs> Jerusalem and Ramallah. Uh, I suspect it will continue to be uh, a central uh, element of our engagement going forward. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's just not true that you don't offer assessments of third party. <clears throat> in fact, this very same group and other groups you do all the time Matt. when it comes to Syria, when it comes to Burma, Myanmar, when it comes to what 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 we do, Iran, Matt, Matt, what we do, we've we you and I have had this you and I have had this very same conversation. You 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 and I have had you you and I have had this very same conversation before, and the same point I made to you last time applies today. We do cite the reports of uh, individual NGOs when we find their findings credible, and uh, when we're uh, lifting up. Uh, a, a policy uh, priority, policy prerogative of ours. Uh, in a case like this, uh, I think this is uh, a report that we certainly take issue with in, in some elements. We don't, uh, as a general matter, or uh, really ever, provide comprehensive assessments of, of third-party reports. That's just not something we do. The, the, only, comprehensive the only comprehensive assessment we provide when it comes to human rights uh, is in our annual human rights report.
Yeah. Can, can, can you elaborate on the new ideas that specifically you got from the Palestinians and the Israelis in the last year? I can't, uh, primarily because uh, this is still a, a volatile period. Uh, we want to uh, keep our discussions uh, with the Israelis, with the Palestinians, uh, but also with other regional parties because uh, there needs to be regional engagement in this challenge. That's part of the reason why uh, we went to Cairo on the front end of the trip. It's part of the reason why Secretary Blinken spoke uh, to Foreign Minister Burita of Morocco on his way back from the trip. It was a core element of the Secretary's discussion uh, engagement today with His Majesty the King uh, of Jordan. Uh, the Secretary is going to remain engaged with others in the region. Uh, we expect uh, the countries of the region will in turn themselves remain engaged uh, with uh, both parties. We want to do everything we can to support the steps that only the parties themselves uh, can take to de-escalate these tensions. So we have on the same topic. Good, yeah. um, Happy. King Abdullah had a meeting with the secretary this morning. Do you have anything to read out from that meeting? And uh, I've got one more on Israel. Well, we will have a, a more formal uh, readout later today, but uh, we were very uh, glad to welcome King Abdullah back to Washington. The secretary did have an opportunity to meet with King Abdullah, uh, His Majesty King Abdullah, uh, this morning at the Jordanian embassy. Um, generally speaking, we continue to work together to advance our mutual objectives in key areas. That, include, that includes uh, promoting a more stable, more integrated, more prosperous uh, Middle East. Uh, Jordan, in um, carrying this out, is our longtime close friend. It's an invaluable uh, partner and an essential uh, strategic partner on a wide range of shared concerns uh, and regional challenges. Our close cooperation on security issues has helped uh, keep Jordanians and, uh, and Americans uh, safer over many years. Jordan plays an indispensable role uh, when it comes to uh, Jerusalem as the custodian of the holy sites in Jerusalem. Uh, Jordan, of course, has an important role to play uh, when it comes to the current moment between Israelis and Palestinians. The Prime Minister Netanyahu said in his CNN interview this week um, that he wouldn't name a final peace solution as a two-state solution as such. Um, and that any final deal would involve Israel having overriding security of Palestinian territories. Uh, does that square with U.S. policies understanding of what a two-state solution is? Does the U.S. understand two-state solution to be sovereignty over each state's borders and security or not? Well, uh, again, I will let the prime minister characterize uh, his remarks and to dispel uh, that out. I think with issues as complex as this, it's often difficult to convey uh, what one means in a, a single sentence. Uh, or uh, an interview as such. Our vision of uh, what is uh, ultimately uh, required ha has not changed. Uh, we continue to believe that a negotiated two-state solutions um, is the only way to bring a sustainable, durable end uh, to this long-standing conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, a two-state solution is the only means by which to protect Israel's identity as a democracy and a Jewish state, while also fulfilling uh, the uh, aspirations, the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people, legitimate <clears throat> aspirations uh, to govern a state of their own, to live in stability and security, to have prosperity uh, and opportunity uh, uh, at their own hands. Same uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Nediwan has sent a letter to the UN Security Council about Israel. Um, it is attributing the latest attack to its um, military installation is in near Isfahan to Israel. Um, it's asking for the UN Security Council to condemn Israel because of that. It is citing comments by Israeli officials that they are threatening Iran. Um, they are claiming that Israel is a danger to peace and stability in the region. Given um, the fact that the U.S. is a permanent member of the um, Security Council with veto power and also the U.S. track record in supporting Israel. Do you have any comments? Well, I, I don't know that uh, any sort of session or any sort of uh, vote certainly has been scheduled. We wouldn't comment uh, ahead of time on any hypothetical like that. But I will say, uh, as a general matter, hearing these messages emanate from Tehran is especially rich. Uh, after all, it is Iran uh, that poses uh, a threat to regional peace and security. You can see that uh, in any number of activities in any number of arenas. It is galloping forward 
uh, with its nuclear program. It continues to be the world's leading exporter uh, of terrorism. It is providing support uh, to proxy groups uh, that uh, profoundly destabilize uh, the region, and it continues to develop uh, a ballistic missile program, among many other uh, elements of uh, its statecraft and, and foreign policy. So uh, to hear Iran uh, point the finger at anyone but itself, um, I think is, is something we would take issue with. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, regarding China, uh, I wonder if you have any more information uh, to share about Secretary Blinken's trip to Beijing. And it's reported that Chinese President Xi Jinping is going to meet him in Beijing. I don't have uh, anything else to offer on uh, the Secretary's planned trip uh, to the PRC. Uh, this is a, a planned trip. Uh, that uh, was an outgrowth, as you know, of uh, the two presidents meeting in uh, Bali last uh, November. The two presidents there discussed the full breadth of uh, what we believe to be the most consequential bilateral relationship uh, on the planet. Um, the, what is, when it comes to our engagement uh, with the PRC, uh, when we have an opportunity to sit down, uh, we discuss uh, the full breadth of that relationship. Uh, that includes the competition that we believe is at the heart uh, of the relationship, uh, but also the collaborative and also the potentially conflictual uh, elements of the relationship uh, as well. Uh, that's always what we do when we engage the PRC. Uh, we speak and act in ways that uh, protect and promote our interests and those of uh, the broader international community. Uh, as we seek uh, to see to it that the competition that really is at the heart of our relationship isn't in a position to uh, spiral into <clears throat> conflict. Uh, so I uh, don't have anything more to add on uh, any planned travel, but uh, we'll let you know uh, when that changes. Well, so pundits in Washington, D.C. said they don't expect any breakthrough or major deliverables from this trip. Is that what we should expect? Every time we engage at a high level with the PRC, uh, it's really about one thing uh, and one thing only, and that's responsible management of, again, what is, we think, the most consequential, complex bilateral relationship uh, on the planet. Uh, and so, of course, uh, what we seek to do is uh, to have these conversations, uh, to see to it that competition doesn't veer into conflict, to see to it that there are guardrails uh, on that relationship uh, so that uh, in the course of our foreign policy, in the course of pursuing uh, our values and our interests, uh, we can do so in a way that serves them, uh, that works for the broader uh, good, the interests of uh, the broader international community, uh, and does so in a way that um, doesn't have the potential or certainly minimizes the potential um, for what our two countries are doing around the world to veer into something uh, potentially much more dangerous. Are you concerned that um, Speaker McCarthy's potential trip to Taiwan may undermine any agreement Secretary Blinken is going to reach with China? Uh, look, I, I am not aware that uh, the Speaker has announced any travel to Taiwan. Uh, the travel on the part of any Speaker of the House of Representatives it is, it is a decision that uh, he or she, and he or she alone, uh, would make. Congress is a co-equal, uh, independent branch of, of government. Uh, what I can say, and we made the same uh, message clear last summer, is our concern with the PRC's reaction to the previous speaker's uh, travel to Taiwan. Uh, in the aftermath of a visit that uh, was not unprecedented, uh, the PRC, uh, our concern is, used that travel as a pretext uh, to intensify what it has been doing over the course of many years now, attempting to erode the status quo, the status quo uh, that has um, uh, really been at the heart of uh, decades of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, so any member of Congress, any speaker, current or future, is going to make uh, his or her own decisions uh, about travel consistent uh, with the independence and the co-equality of, uh, uh, of the legislative branch, but uh, will continue to speak out when we see the PRC attempting to undermine uh, the status quo that at every step we and our partners and allies around the world have only sought uh, to strengthen and preserve. 
Let me, let me move around a, a little bit. Um, Janie, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions in North Korea and South Korea. First question, a North Korean ambassador to UN said that it would not give up nuclear weapons as long as uh, the United States has nuclear weapons. How are you going to respond to this? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. North Korean ambassador to United Nations said that it would not give up nuclear mm -hmm. weapons as long as the United States has nuclear weapons. How would you respond to I, I don't have a uh, specific response to that beyond to reiterate uh, what is uh, and what has been our approach to the de to uh, uh, to this challenge, uh, and that is an approach that seeks a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that was an outgrowth of a policy review that this administration took on in the early months uh, of the administration. We've made clear time and again to the DPRK that we are ready, willing, and able. Uh, to sit down uh, with them, to have discussions about practical steps we can take towards uh, that ultimate goal of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, but time and again, the DPRK has indicated uh, to us and to the international community, oftentimes in no uncertain terms, uh, that it has uh, no desire at the present to engage in that. Uh, so rather than uh, wait idly by, uh, we have continued to uh, consult and to coordinate very closely with our treaty allies in the region. That, of course, includes Japan and the ROK on a bilateral basis, but also on a, on a trilateral basis, uh, knowing that we have a, an ironclad commitment to the security uh, of our treaty allies, Japan uh, and the ROK. And this is a challenge that uh, confronts all of us, and it's a challenge we'll, uh, in turn, have to confront uh, collectively as well. Okay, although North Korea has launched uh, many missiles if the foreign exchange reserves are still strong, as you know, North Korea continues to spend a huge amount of money for nuclear missile development through cyber hacking and money laundering. And the headquarters of the hacking organization is located in China. How do you concern? about this and uh, when Secretary Blinken visit China, will these issues be uh, discussed? Well, let me say as a general matter that in every senior level engagement, every uh, significant senior level engagement we have with the PRC, the DPRK is a topic of discussion uh, because the DPRK's nuclear weapons program, its ballistic missiles program, a ballistic missile program is not only uh, a threat to the United States, it's not only a threat uh, to our allies in the region, but uh, it poses a threat to regional peace and security. Uh, it is something that also implicates uh, the PRC. Our message to countries around the world, especially to those permanent members of the UN Security Council that themselves uh, have voted in favor of uh, now various UN Security Council resolutions, is that all countries, but especially those countries that are signatories of UN Security Council resolutions, have a responsibility uh, to fully comply with and to enforce uh, the sanctions that are on the books. That has not always been the case. It has not always been the case from the PRC. It's not always been the case uh, from Russia. Uh, there are other countries where we've raised this uh, as well. It's important, again, uh, not for our own interests, but uh, for the purposes of regional peace and security that countries around the world hold the DPRK to account and send a very clear signal uh, to the North Korean regime uh, that there will be costs and consequences for its continued provocations uh, that threaten the United States, our treaty allies, but again, also the broader region. Yeah, one more. Lastly, uh, Secretary Blinken and the South Korean uh, Foreign Minister Park Jin have a meeting tomorrow. What topic will they discuss at the meeting? You'll have an opportunity to hear directly from both of them uh, in the context of uh, that bilateral engagement tomorrow. But 
uh, the, the ROK uh, is a treaty ally of ours. There are a number uh, of issues that uh, will be on the table. We've already discussed one of them, the DPRK, but uh, our relationship is uh, multifaceted. Uh, there are a number of priorities that uh, we are pursuing bilaterally with the ROK on the economic front, on the diplomatic front, on the political front, when it comes to our people to people ties, uh, on the regional front, but also uh, on the global front. Uh, the ROK is uh, has an influential voice as an influential country on uh, the world stage we collaborate in any number of uh, multilateral and global venues uh, and tomorrow's engagement between secretary blinken and his south korean counterpart will be an opportunity to uh, discuss all of that and you'll have an opportunity to hear from both of them tomorrow uh, Kat? Uh, yeah um i just wanted to ask about the three americans wrongfully detained in china um David Lin, Kai Lee, and Mark Sweden. Can you commit that the secretary will raise their names in his meetings with Chinese officials when he goes over the course of the next few weeks? Uh, again, I'm not going to uh, get into a meeting uh, that we haven't uh, formally announced uh, just yet. It's certainly not in any detail. But what I will say uh, is that I can commit to you that every time uh, the secretary uh, has a significant uh, bilateral engagement uh, with uh, a country where uh, this is, in fact, a concern of ours, uh, it is something uh, that is raised. Uh, we raise these cases on an individual basis. Uh, we raise the broader systemic uh, challenge. The secretary has no higher priority than the safety and security of American citizens uh, around the world. Of course, that includes American citizens who are wrongfully detained anywhere in the world. Uh, the secretary is very much personally invested in this. He often speaks uh, with the families of wrongful detainees uh, on uh, the specifics of, of their cases. Uh, he has invested quite a bit in the diplomacy uh, to try to deter uh, this type of activity in the first place, to make clear to those countries who would engage in wrongful detention that uh, this is not only something that the United States vehemently opposes, but uh, it will carry costs and consequences from uh, the rest of the world. That's an ongoing project. We are committed, uh, just as we work with countries around the world, to re to create and to reinforce that norm, uh, to doing everything we can to see our wrongful detainees returned home to their families uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, and oftentimes that uh, includes very direct, very blunt, very frank conversations uh, with our counterparts in countries where this is applicable. And as far as we know, there aren't any active negotiations between the U.S. and China to secure the release of these three Americans. Is that accurate, or would you describe it in a different way? I would describe it in a different way, but again, I'm not going to go into detail. I would describe it as uh, uh, the fact that we are always uh, working to see the release of, of wrongful detainees. Uh, we do that in ways uh, in different ways, oftentimes in discrete ways, uh, but just because something may not be on the surface doesn't uh, necessarily mean it's not happening. And one last question, just following up on the McCarthy question. Um, you said that you're not aware of any potential McCarthy trip to Taiwan being announced. Is this department aware of any trip being planned currently? That's not a question for us. It's a question for the speaker in his office. Uh, Nazir. Thank you, Ned. Uh, there is a uh, question number one today was uh, our topic in Afghanistan about the former President Ghani that he received a uh, hundred uh, million, hundred and ten something around this amount. He received uh, this amount uh, from Qatar uh, government as an, they say it was a gift. President Ghani followers say this was a gift, but people said, Afghan people said this uh, not get bribed sometimes and sold Afghanistan. Uh, different people has a different idea. Italian reporter reported about this, disclosed this information. I comment on that. And the second question you mentioned about more restrictions on the Taliban, they don't pay attention in the past also. The Taliban travel a lot and they don't care about the US sanction. Any comment about that? And the third question, so many Afghan refugees who stay in Abu Dhabi, they lost it. And, uh, you know, they raised the voices and it took a long time for them to come to the United States. Any comment? Okay. Uh, sure, I'll see if I can remember and, and get through all three, all three of those. On your first question, uh, I've seen the, the Italian report, I'm aware of it. 
We're certainly not in a position to confirm it, um, so I don't have anything more for you there beyond uh, to say that Qatar is an indispensable partner of the United States. We are deeply appreciative uh, of the role that Qatar has played when it comes to uh, our approach to Afghanistan. Qatar, of course, uh, has hosted uh, those individuals that have departed Afghanistan uh, during and since uh, the end of uh, U.S. military engagement in Afghanistan in August of uh, 2021. Uh, Qatar has opened its doors. It's been a, a generous host. It's been um, a stalwart partner to uh, the United States, but more importantly to uh, so many of the people of Afghanistan uh, who have sought uh, to begin new lives in the United States and countries uh, around the world. Uh, of course, our, our partnership with Qatar uh, goes well beyond our shared approach uh, to Afghanistan. Qatar uh, has also been a force for uh, stability uh, and uh, broader integration across uh, the Middle East region. We work with Qatar on a number of uh, bilateral and multilateral priorities, uh, and of course that cooperation will continue going forward. On the question of the Taliban, you are correct in the sense that uh, the Taliban have repeatedly failed to uphold the commitments that they have made to the international community, but more importantly, the commitments that they themselves have made to their own people. Uh, you will have to ask the Taliban uh, for the thinking behind uh, the egregious decisions they have made. It could well be that the Taliban is under the impression that it could have it, it can have it both ways, uh, that it can take uh, these draconian, brutal, repressive measures against its own people uh, and still cultivate improved relations with the international community. Uh, we seek to make very clear to the Taliban that it cannot have it both ways, uh, that it can fail to uphold its commitments to the Afghan people and thereby close all avenues of opportunity for improved relations. Uh, we are doing that ourselves, but much more importantly, uh, we're acting in a coordinated way with uh, dozens of countries around the world to signal very clearly, uh, both in words and in deed, including uh, the actions that we made public yesterday, uh, that any Taliban illusion uh, that they can continue to take this approach uh, when it comes to their own people is nothing more uh, than an illusion if they do seek improved relations uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, when it comes to the Afghans who are remaining in um, uh, the UAE, uh, this is uh, another country, uh, the UAE, that uh, has demonstrated incredible generosity to the people of Afghanistan, incredible uh, partnership with the United States and many countries who uh, have been helping the people of Afghanistan in any number of ways, including by facilitating the departure of uh, those who uh, wish to uh, depart the country. Uh, we're working with uh, the Emiratis uh, and our, our partners uh, on the ground to process Afghans who uh, remain at the uh, Emirates, uh, Emiratis humanitarian city uh, just as, as quickly uh, as we can. Uh, as you know, for those Afghans who uh, ultimately uh, will arrive in the United States, there is a vetting process uh, that is uh, undertaken uh, in um, uh, the Emirates uh, in this case. Uh, that process can take some time, but we're working very closely with our partners uh, throughout the executive branch to do everything we can uh, to cut down uh, that processing time while ensuring that we're not cutting any corners whatsoever uh, when it comes to the vetting process. We've been able to improve that over time. We're going to uh, keep at it uh, to uh, address uh, the concerns when it comes to humanitarian city. Thank you. Alex? Thanks so much. I'll come back. Uh, a couple of questions on uh, Russia. And then we get into the Please come back to me on the process. Um, in your leader today said that international uh, center for prosecution signed in Ukraine will be established in, in the heart. Uh, does the Biden administration support this idea? Uh, so on this, Alex, you know that we are promoting and supporting accountability uh, in every uh, viable way, in every way that we think will be effective. Uh, we've spoken quite a bit about our support for uh, the Ukrainian prosecutor general, uh, for that office that has already undertaken prosecutions, has secured convictions through free and fair uh, uh, trials, and has actually sentenced uh, individuals to uh, prison terms for the war crimes that they've committed on sovereign Ukrainian soil. Uh, that is a process that is well underway. There are other processes that are uh, underway to varying degrees um, as well. The OSCE 
uh, has its own uh, process that we've supported. The ICC uh, is engaged in a process that uh, we're supporting. Uh, the UN, too, uh, has an accountability mechanism that the United States helped to establish. Uh, we're in constant conversation with our Ukrainian partners, in this case with uh, other allies and partners around the around the world uh, to, dis to determine if there are other venues, if there are other mechanisms uh, that can promote the goal of accountability for uh, those Russian officials who were either directly responsible for perpetrating or, or responsible for ordering uh, what ultimately turned out to be uh, war crimes. Those are conversations that are ongoing. Is it a position that says that Putin should be punished in the court? Uh, that is a question uh, not for me. That is a question for legal authorities. Uh, there is uh, uh, war crimes carries with it um, various uh, definitions uh, and criteria. It's uh, we, we don't render legal verdicts uh, from uh, the podium here. We leave that to uh, the appropriate authorities. Um, there's a, a discussion over you know, uh, coming up with alternative, let's say, uh, designation of the Russian crimes, which is maybe not designated as a you know. Uh, so we continue to have conversations with uh, our partners on the Hill uh, about new vehicles that uh, we might be able to take advantage of that would allow us to uh, apply on the Russian Federation uh, additional measures in response to the atrocities that it is uh, perpetrating against the people of Ukraine. Uh, you know, Alex, that we have uh, already uh, levied against Russia uh, financial sanctions, export controls, uh, other economic measures as well that are having a tremendous bite, uh, not only in the Russian economy, but also uh, in Russia's ability to wage war uh, against Ukraine. Uh, you can see reflections of that in any uh, number of steps that Russia has been forced to take. The fact that Russia uh, is now turning to, uh, shall we say, non-traditional partners like Iran and the DPRK uh, to backfill its military wares is a very concrete sign to us uh, that we are starving the Russian Federation systematically of the inputs that it needs uh, to create the outputs that ultimately uh, would perpetrate such violence and brutality on the Ukrainian people. Uh, we're always going to look for uh, additional measures we can take under existing authorities that are available uh, to us, but we're working with the Hill, um, taking, into con taking into consideration uh, their concerns, taking into consideration uh, the concerns that we've heard from various stakeholders, including uh, humanitarian organizations and other humanitarian actors about uh, the implications of a potential uh, state sponsor of terror designation to uh, determine if there are other vehicles that could be crafted that would allow us to apply additional uh, accountability on the Russian Federation. Thank you. I think we find to get your uh, thoughts on the ongoing debate over Paris 2024 games. Uh, and as you know, a couple of countries have uh, issued a statement and they are asking for banning Russia and Belarusian. Uh, apples. Uh, first of all, are, are you able to uh, reflect that statement from the U.S. position? Also, will the United States take a part if uh, there is different outcome? So in December, uh, the International Olympic Committee outlined its continued sanctions of Russia and reaffirmed its support for Ukraine, uh, which was also supported by the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Uh, the United States has signed on to three letters to support Ukraine and to hold Russia accountable for its war. Uh, these letters called for a series of measures, uh, namely to suspend Russia and Belarus's sports, uh, sport national governing boards from international sport federations, to remove individuals closely aligned to the Russian and Belarusian states, uh, including but not limited to government officials, uh, from positions of influence on international sport federations, uh, such as boards, organizing committees, other elements, and to encourage national and international sports organizations to suspend the broadcasting of sports competition into Russia and Belarus. Um, look, in cases where national and international sports organizations and other event organizers choose to permit athletes, um, but not just athletes, officials, administrators, others, uh, from Russia and Belarus to participate in sporting events, um, a couple things apply. It should be clear that they are not representing uh, the Russian or Belarusian states. Uh, the use of official state Russian and Belarusian flags, emblems, and anthems should be prohibited. Uh, and appropriate steps should be taken to ensure that any public statement made uh, or, or symbols displayed at sporting events by, again, 
athletes, uh, administrators, <coughs> officials are consistent with this approach. Uh, we are proud of our close partnership with Team USA, and we look forward to our collective work around the world uh, to use sport for good. Um, and that includes in the United States and in countries uh, around the world. Uh, we continue to support the people of Ukraine and to hold uh, Russia accountable uh, for this unjust war in Ukraine. Uh, but ultimately, we would defer you to uh, the U.S. Olympic and Paralymp Paralympic Committee uh, to comment on its position. I think you asked to my second part of the question that if they don't, through that banning process. Uh, that's that's right. We 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 put forward our position as have a number of uh, of other countries. Uh, so we'll we'll entertain that question if it's a, a real question. Let me move around just a little bit. Yes, sir. Uh, follow up on the China. Uh, China suspended and then canceled the eight lines or channels of communication with the United States in response to the Speaker Pelosi's trip to Taiwan last August. So could you tell us the current situation and status of these channels and especially the ones with security issues such as defense policy coordination talks. And if they are still suspended, will Secretary Ash begin to restore these channels? So this goes back to uh, your colleague's question uh, when I noted the fact that this uh, relationship is uh, the most consequential uh, and complex on the face of the earth. When we think about our bilateral relationship with the PRC, uh, we tend to think about it in three ways. Uh, the areas that are competitive, uh, and that's a realm that really dominates uh, our relationship with and our approach to the PRC. Uh, the elements that have the potential to be conflictual, um, that is to say the elements that may be prone to veer uh, from competition into conflict. And those are elements where we, where we seek to establish those guardrails to do everything we can uh, to avoid uh, unintended conflict uh, with the PRC. But third, uh, there are areas that are collaborative or have the potential uh, to be collaborative. Uh, some of them are quite obvious. Uh, climate, public health, uh, drugs, uh, and other uh, transnational threats that uh, our two countries face, but also the rest of the world confronts. Uh, to us, it's important that we do all we can to act responsibly in those realms, to cooperate uh, as much as uh, we can in those realms, again, because it's profoundly in our interest, but also because it is expected of us. It's expected of us by the rest of the world that the United States, in the case of climate, for example, the number one and the number two emitters in the world, do everything we can to reduce greenhouse gases and to limit uh, global warming consistent with uh, the Paris pledges. Uh, that's just uh, one area. When the PRC uh, curtailed this cooperation in this summer uh, in the aftermath of the former speaker's visit, we made very clear uh, that the PRC was uh, not doing this solely as a disservice to us, but uh, this really was disregarding uh, the interests and the wishes of the rest of the world. Uh, part of the conversation the two presidents had in Bali uh, was about uh, seeing to it that uh, our teams work together uh, to seek to maximize collaboration and cooperation uh, in these potentially collaborative uh, areas. When we sit down with the PRC, not only will we discuss the competitive elements, the adversarial elements, but uh, we will discuss uh, how we can potentially uh, deepen those uh, areas of, of cooperation in real practical ways. But yes. are those yes. channels open? Let me can you just on. Yes. Yeah. Can, can I just... uh, it, you've, you've seen from Secretary Kerry, let me, let me take climate, you've seen from Secretary Kerry and his team that uh, he has had engagement in recent weeks with uh, his PRC counterpart. Uh, I would leave it to the PRC to characterize uh, their uh, level of cooperation, but uh, we think it is vital uh, and we know uh, the rest of the world thinks it's vital as well. Yes. Thank you, Nick. There are some reports saying that Iran got a portion of dollar that Iraq has received in the last two weeks, and the U.S. has a solid evidence on that. I'm working to put more restrictions on Iraq in getting dollar from its oil revenue. Would you comment on, it, on these reports, and how does the U.S. working with Iraq to overcome the concerns you have on the cash flow to Iran? My second question, the Kurdistan region parties have loggerhead in different areas for weeks and months. This has led to rise eyebrows elsewhere, including the United States. So how does the U.S. view worsening relations between KRI parties 
and what engagements do you have with this market? The second second was how do we do how do we view engagement between uh, Baghdad and Erbil? No, oh. how do you view the worsening relations between the Christian region parties, the, the Christian region parties, and what engagements do you have to help them to overcome the, the blockages they have for so long time? Uh, so on your second question, this is really a question for Iraqi authorities. Uh, uh, the Iraqi people seek a government that is responsible and responsive to their needs. Uh, the Prime Minister Sudani and his team have uh, stated their commitment to doing everything they can to serve uh, the needs of the Iraqi people. The United States stands as a partner uh, to uh, the Iraqi government and the Iraqi people to assist uh, in any way we can. Uh, we've assisted over the years when it comes to uh, security, when it comes to economic assistance, when it comes to humanitarian assistance, uh, that partnership is ongoing. But when it comes to relations between parties within uh, the Iraqi government, that's a question for uh, the government of Iraq. Uh, to the first part of your question, this goes back to uh, the point I was making in response to your colleague's earlier question. We know uh, that Iran's chief export around the world is instability. Uh, Iran's uh, chief export is insecurity, attempting to take take advantage uh, of uh, potential power vacuums uh, to spread its influence in ways that are typically profoundly unhelpful. Uh, we seek to be a partner uh, to Iraq uh, to help with stability, to help with security, to help uh, with uh, economic prosperity as well. Uh, we're doing that in any uh, number of ways. Uh, but it goes back to the commitment that we have to the Iraqi government and the Iraqi people uh, to use our resources, uh, to use uh, our voice, to use our standing on the international stage uh, to help fulfill the aspirations of the Iraqi people. Yes. Hey, thank you. Today, 27 senators, both Democrat and Republican, they sent a letter to President Biden asking him to not approve the sale of F-16 until Turkey agrees to let uh, Finland and Sweden to join NATO. Do you share the same position uh, with the senators, and can you explain us, since the technical co uh, talks have been concluded, why you are delaying to send the official, the formal notification to the Congress? We've had an opportunity to speak about this uh, both in recent weeks, but going back into the summer when President Biden was sitting right next to President Erdogan in Madrid during the NATO summit. Uh, and Pre President Biden made very clear that the United States uh, supports the provision of F 16s to Turkey. Uh, Turkey, of course, is a NATO ally. It has uh, legitimate uh, security concerns. We want to do everything we can to bring uh, NATO and to and see to it that is fully integrated uh, into the NATO alliance. Uh, so that speaks to our support for the F-16s. Uh, in our government, these are decisions that are not only within that are not only uh, left to the executive branch. Uh, these are uh, the types of decisions that uh, our uh, legislative colleagues, our colleagues in Congress, uh, also have uh, a say over. Uh, we've made clear to Congress our support uh, for the F-16s. Congress um, has uh, made its position clear, or I should say individual uh, sen senators or groups of senators uh, in some cases have made their uh, positions uh, clear. We're continuing to engage Turkey. We're continuing to um, engage the Hill. Uh, but our point is that Turkey is a, a valuable uh, NATO ally. Uh, its role in the alliance has been uh, a profoundly important one uh, over the course of uh, decades now. And so we'll continue to find ways to uh, see to it that we can work together uh, with Turkey, even as uh, we seek to make, make the NATO alliance even stronger. Uh, and we think making the NATO alliance stronger uh, would entail bringing the membership from 30 to 32. Finland and Sweden have expressed their aspirations uh, to join the alliance. Not only have they expressed their aspirations, but uh, 28 out of 30 countries uh, in the alliance have uh, ratified uh, the uh, articles of accession. The United States Senate did so uh, in what was record time or near record time when it comes to uh, such a treaty. So there is overwhelming bipartisan support for uh, the accession of Finland and Sweden into NATO. It is something that the administration uh, over uh, the administration strongly uh, supports. We believe that uh, both countries uh, are ready, and these are countries with advanced militaries. They are advanced democracies, uh, and they are in a position uh, to make the alliance to which we belong, and Turkey belongs, and 28 other countries uh, belong uh, even stronger than it already is. 
But the, uh, let me move around. Yes, in the back. Uh, back on Secretary Blinken's trip to China, um, will he raise the human rights situation of Tibetans and Uyghurs during that trip? Uh, again, I don't want to uh, preview uh, the agenda items of a meeting we haven't announced, but uh, I will just say uh, that uh, in every uh, engagement uh, around the world, human rights is a, a feature uh, of those discussions. Uh, that is the case in countries where we work together uh, to promote and to protect human rights around the world. Uh, that is also the case in countries that fail uh, to uphold uh, commitments to human rights. Uh, we've discussed this previously with uh, our, our PRC counterparts, uh, and I would expect that uh, in any extended meeting uh, between the secretary and um, uh, PRC officials that uh, it will feature once again. Uh, yes? Uh, my question is about U.S. citizens in Mexico. Uh, there is a prominent front page story in the Los Angeles Times today showing how pharmacies and Mexican resorts uh, are selling fake prescription pills uh, laced with fentanyl targeting precisely uh, U.S. tourists who are visiting. Are you aware or the State Department is aware of any cases of U.S. tourists that have fallen victims of this kind of, of pills? And what steps can the U.S. take to, you know, prevent this, this terrible trend? Uh, I am not uh, immediately aware of uh, individual cases in any case. Uh, it's not something we would speak to uh, from a podium for, uh, for example. But uh, we are uh, intimately uh, aware of the threat that is posed by fentanyl, um, not only to U.S. tourists in Mexico, uh, but to Americans and to people around the world. Um, this is something that Secretary Blinken is seized with, and he's seized with it because fentanyl is a leading killer of Americans between the ages of uh, 18 and 49. It is um, a threat that our country has been grappling with, it's a threat uh, that has ended for too many lives in uh, too many cases, far too many young, promising lives prematurely. Uh, so we are working with partners around the world, including uh, Mexico, but uh, in some cases countries much further afield uh, to stem not only the flow of fentanyl itself, but oftentimes the precursors. Uh, that is to say the ingredients that are later assembled uh, in third countries to produce fentanyl um, that in far too many cases is then shipped uh, into American communities and takes a devastating toll on people within uh, those communities. It's something uh, we're committed to. We're uh, committed to doing it with partners. We're committed to redoubling our efforts uh, with our uh, partners uh, within the executive branch, within this government uh, as well, to do everything we can uh, to, to address um, this, uh, this lethal threat. Ukraine, uh, Kita, uh, sure. no, thank you. Um, Russian media, uh, state media, are citing a comment made by Undersecretary Nuland in an Al Jazeera interview, and the comment is that, and I quote, the U.S. is working to meet Ukraine's needs, including long-range missiles. Is the U.S. considering giving um, Ukraine long-range missiles? Uh, you know, we don't uh, preview security assistance announcements uh, that have not yet been made. But what I can say generally is that we are always in conversation with our Ukrainian partners. We're always in conversation uh, with the dozens of countries who have signed up to help Ukraine uh, with security assistance, with economic assistance, with humanitarian assistance to determine uh, what, in the first instance, Ukraine needs. Uh, and from there to determine what we have and what we're in a position to provide. Uh, so these are conversations that are ongoing on multiple fronts when it comes to the needs of uh, our Ukrainian partners, but I just don't have anything to announce or to preview. Final question. Um, 14 Republic senators wrote a letter to Secretary Blanke uh, to press him on China. I just wonder how did this affect your agenda and what is your response? Well, we uh, appreciate constructive engagement from Congress when it comes to our approach to the PRC. Uh, in fact, Secretary Blinken was on the Hill last week. He met with a bicameral, bipartisan group of uh, House members and senators uh, to hear their perspective on our approach to the PRC, to hear from them uh, what they would like to see from us and our engagement with the PRC, and in turn uh, to um, discuss with them uh, what we've seen and heard and what we intend uh, to uh, convey to our um, partner, to, uh, to the PRC. Uh, so this is a process that is ongoing, um, uh, but we very much 
uh, welcome this sort of constructive engagement, these uh, constructive ideas, uh, and uh, it's a conversation that uh, will continue uh, in the aftermath uh, of uh, engagement with the PRC. Can I yes. ask my Morocco question? Uh, really quick. Okay. Really quick. Uh, there's a, I don't know if you're, if you're aware of it, there is a, uh, a Saudi who's being extradited from Morocco. His family says that if he's extradited, his name is Hassan Rabi. I don't know if you know his case. You know this case? Uh, I'm, I'm not immediately familiar with it, but you, we'll see if we can. Out, you know, yep. take it out. We'll okay, ask, Michelle. He's no, being extradited, and they fear if he's extradited, he will be subject to imprisonment and torture. Got it. Do you have any, uh, anything on the uh, meeting between the US, France, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, on Lebanon, and uh, news reports saying that the uh, French officials are coming to Washington? Discuss sanctions with on the transportation of gas and electric from Egypt and Jordan to Lebanon. Uh, when it comes to uh, the meeting that you're referring to next week in in Paris, I suspect we'll have more details on this. Uh, in the coming days, but we look forward to meeting with French, Egyptian, Qatari, and Saudi partners in Paris uh, to discuss ways to encourage and support Lebanese leaders uh, to elect a president, to uh, form a government, uh, and to implement uh, necessary economic reform. So we'll have more for you on, on that engagement. On what uh, level? That on what level this uh, would happen in uh, is going to happen in Paris? We we haven't uh, announced representation just yet, but I suspect we'll have more details as it gets so as it gets closer. I, again, I, I don't have anything to offer specifically on that, but uh, France is a, a partner on many fronts, including when it comes to uh, our shared approach to uh, the challenges uh, faced by uh, the people of Lebanon, the humanitarian uh, plight uh, that uh, the, the Lebanese people are uh, enduring, and as this Paris meeting indicates, uh, the approach that together we can take to address, uh, help address uh, the humanitarian, the economic, uh, and the other needs of the Lebanese people. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.